Imagine finding a door in your home, one that wasn't there before, and when you open the door, on the other side is a room that cannot possibly exist. In fact, this room is so large that there's no way that it could fit inside of your home. Now, I know what you're thinking, that'll increase the property value. No. Oh, this is fantastic. Maybe with all this extra square footage, I can get a home gym. No, you're missing the point. This is terrifying. Welcome to Paperback Journeys, where today we're gonna to be talking about House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. I've been talking about this book for a while and I finally got around to reading it. I took off three days from work so that I could just completely immerse myself in the story. And this book, this book is different. I think the best way to think about this book is to kind of compare it to one of those Russian nesting dolls. At its core, this book is about this mind-bending documentary called The Navidson Record. And in this documentary, a photographer and his family move into a house only to find that Inside is a room that cannot possibly exist. Without getting into too many spoilers, it's just too big to be in the house. There's this short film that also gets released. It's kind of like a home video, and it's called The Five and a Half Minute Hallway. And it basically shows a uh, like a, just a handheld camera uh, that looks into the hallway, and then uh, the person operating the camera goes outside, crawls outside the window, and faces the camera at where the hallway should be, and it's just the outside of the house. And then he climbs back around inside the other window, comes back around, and then points it back at the hallway to show that this hallway is leading to nowhere. So obviously this is pretty creepy, right? And so the owner of the house starts to take measurements of the inside of the house and the outside of the house. And what he recognizes is that the inside of the house is larger than the outside of the house. He's got a little bit of a TARDIS situation going on. This book is a horror book. And, and you might think that maybe on the surface, a, a, a house being larger on the inside than the outside might not necessarily sound that scary, but I think it's really the implications of what that means. Clearly, this hallway, which can't exist by the rules of physics, was not built by human hands. And if it wasn't built by a human, who did build it? And why? And where does the hallway lead? When this documentary is released, the audience naturally starts to question, you know, is this real? Or is this like a spoof? It kind of reminds me a little bit uh, of The Blair Witch Project. I don't know if you're old enough to remember when The Blair Witch Project first came out. And in the media and, uh, and amongst friends, everyone was discussing, like, is this a real documentary? Because uh, this kind of film hadn't really been released before. And so, yeah, because everything was handheld, people were asking themselves, are these actors? Or is this like real found footage that everyone's reacting to? And it was kind of spooky and eerie. And the Navidson record kind of has that same uh, reputation and the, those same rumors that are spreading around. Is this real? So that's the first layer of the story. The second layer of the story uh, revolves around a character called Zampano. And he is effectively, what I'll try and show you here, if you look here on the very first page, House of Leaves by Zampano with notes by Johnny Truant. And, and we'll get to Johnny Truant in a moment. But effectively, what this book is are notes that are made by Zampano about the documentary. It's kind of like a, a scene by scene uh, notes that he's taking as he watches it and as he kind of reviews everything that's happening in the documentary. As he's taking these notes, he's slowly losing his mind and he's, he's getting other people to help him uh, to take down these notes because uh, Zampano is, a, is blind. And then he passes away before he's able to publish this as a complete manuscript. And Johnny Truant is the character that finds his notes. 
I think a lot of people who read this book would probably consider Johnny Truant to be the main character in the book. He's the one that's kind of addressing us directly. Uh, and he's writing in footnotes all of his uh, pontifications about what this means. He's kind of interpreting Zampano's notes, who is himself interpreting the documentary. So like I say, there's a lot of layers to this. Almost all of the footnotes that we find are from Johnny Truant. But he has a little bit of difficulty sticking to the subject of the documentary or the notes. Uh, a lot of the time he'll be talking about what's going on in his own life. And uh, mostly he talks about the women that he slept with. And we'll get to that, by the way, because I've got a lot to say about that. But Johnny Truen is effectively our guide as he struggles to make sense of Zampano's manuscript. An interesting piece of trivia about House of Leaves is that it was initially published as parts on the internet. And I think that that probably helped build a cult following before it was collected together and published into a physical copy. And when I say a cult following, I mean people are in to this book. Some people have made this book their whole personality, it seems like. If you go online, what you're going to find is a very lively, animated, active community that revolves around this book. There are people who read and reread this book and they're trying to decode all of the themes and the hidden messages that might be contained within. Everyone has their own interpretations and so they share these interpretations. Um, some of them don't go down very well. Like I say, things can get pretty combative in the House of Leaves community and uh, people get angry at each other. I, I'm, I, I like the drama. And I think that having this kind of active community that are all trying to interpret the book whilst Zampano is trying to interpret the documentary and Johnny Truant is trying to interpret Zampano's notes, it kind of blurs the line between fiction and reality. And that's a lot of fun. I think House of Leaves is difficult to categorize because it blends uh, elements of horror and scholarly examination. And Danielewski uh, has an anecdote where a woman approached him after a, a speech that he gave at some function. And she said to him, you know, I'm surprised that many people think of this as a horror. For me, it was a romance. And Danielewski says, do you know what? You're the first person that ever understood that. Did this conversation really happen? <laughs> maybe not. I don't know. I think maybe that's just uh, the author's way of uh, communicating a message that he wanted to communicate to the audience. And he just used a useful anecdote. But, you know, it's fine. Yeah, it's got elements of romance in it as well, I suppose. Yeah. The book really... I think is most infamous for its unique and unconventional narrative structure. This includes footnotes made by Johnny Truant, mirrored text, pages that require the reader to turn the book around to read it fully. There's parts of the book which are written in braille or musical notes. One of my favorite parts of the book actually is a section where you need to take the first letter of every word to kind of de decode a secret message that's hidden inside of this kind of gibberish. And I found that bit to be one of the most effective parts of the book. It was definitely one of the most creepy parts of the book. I really Really enjoyed that. I think this book is a good example of uh, gothic literature, which is actually a new term for me, I have to confess. Uh, but it basically means text which requires significant effort on the part of the reader in order to kind of navigate the story. In ergodic literature, basically, uh, the, the act of reading is not a passive thing, it's an active thing. And that's why this book is not available on Kindle or on Audible. I, I, I just can't imagine how it could possibly be available in those formats. Another interesting thing about the book is that it has a soundtrack. Kind of. Danielewski uh, was raised in a creative household. His father was a filmmaker. His sister is a singer-songwriter named Poe. Anyway, Poe released an album named Haunted in the same year that House of Leaves was published. And it's undeniable that 
both the book and the sound uh, and the uh, the album, sorry, uh, have a similar kind of tone. I think the most direct connection between the album and the book is a song called "Hey Pretty," which features the author of House of Leaves reading excerpts. Uh, I, I, I think it's like along the bridge of the song. So yeah, obviously these two are kind of inspired by one another in some way. I think some people might think that that's a little bit gimmicky. Personally, I think it's pretty cool. I like, I like that sort of thing. Speaking of the tone, one of the main reasons that I wanted to read House of Leaves is because of its reputation. A lot of people told me that this is the scariest book that they've ever read. And some people said that after reading it, they couldn't even have the book in the house. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, I need to read this, right? Because I love that feeling of being terrified. And unfortunately, in that regard, it didn't satisfy. It, it, it was a little bit of a letdown. Don't get me wrong. It, it was scary in parts. There were definitely eerie parts. Uh, sections of the book that were quite unsettling and I felt my heart kind of quicken and my breathing get a little bit shallow. Yeah, it, it was scary in, in certain parts and I thought, here we go. Now it's going to get really frightening. And um, I would say it's quite scary, but not the most scary book I've ever read. The fear mostly revolves around a kind of existential dread. It's the idea that there's something that you can't see, a black pit that's just completely indifferent to your existence. I think the easiest brand of fear that I can compare it to is thalassophobia, which is a fear of deep waters. And I think one of the things that make really, really deep waters scary is because we don't know what's just outside of our vision. We can't see the edges of an ocean. And so by contrast, we feel tiny and maybe insignificant as well. This just this vastness is scary. Okay, so let's talk about some of the characters. First off, you've got Will Navidson, who is a prize-winning photographer, uh, who is the central figure of the Navidson record, which, as I said, that's the core of the story. He's loosely based on a real-life guy called Kevin Carter, who won a Pulitzer Prize for a photograph that he took whilst he was in Sudan. It's a very famous photograph. Uh, you probably would know it if you saw it. It's of um, a small Sudanese child who is starving to death and there's a vulture in the background that is just waiting. As I said, uh, Carter won the Pulitzer uh, Prize for that and within a year of winning the prize, he took his own life. And you can't help but kind of surmise that that is in part because of the guilt that he felt. I mean, imagine winning this big prestigious prize at the hands of the suffering of a real life human, a, a small innocent child. And here you are just sort of like getting your picture taken, winning a trophy. You know, that kind of contrast is so gross. Will Navidson has a very similar backstory, almost identical really. Uh, he's an interesting character because he only feels comfortable in moments of discomfort, if you know what I mean. Um, he only feels comfortable when he's challenging himself or facing some kind of danger. He gets easily restless. You can tell he's not suited to a domestic life. He just wants to get out there and explore. And then you've got Johnny Truant, who, oh man, you know, I've got to say, I didn't love Johnny Truant. Some people online in in these active communities actually say that the book is far more enjoyable if you just skip all the parts with Johnny Truant in. And, and there are parts in this book that you are actively encouraged to skip over, right? So there's just like long lists of styles of architecture. There's just pages and pages and pages. And so, you know, it, it, even the book says, if there's any parts you want to skip, it's fine. It's kind of unconventional in that way again, you know? But yeah, some people say, oh, all of the parts with Johnny Truant, you can just skip. That's about a third of the book, maybe more. So, you know, although I can kind of see where these people are coming from, um, I don't necessarily agree that you can do that, especially on your first read. I, I'll just say that if, if you're planning on reading this and you're thinking, maybe I'll just skip all these bits with Johnny Truant, 
uh, I, I, I don't think you should do that. There's so many times in this book where Johnny's talking about all of his sexual exploits and all of the women that he's been with. And I just found those parts to be so repetitive and boring. Uh, he kind of goes into a lot of detail um, and there's just, there's just nothing interesting about it. Also, Johnny will often write in a kind of stream of consciousness. And I very rarely in any books uh, enjoy that kind of like rambling writing style that is often found in characters that are losing their mind. And I get it, right? I, I get why the character is writing that way because we as the reader are supposed to kind of start to feel as though we're becoming untethered from reality and we're starting to lose a sense of what's real and, and, and feel that kind of anxiety that is consuming consuming Johnny I, and it it is effective in parts but you know sometimes I was just like I want to get back to find out what's going on in the house you know there's large parts of this book that I think we're not supposed to understand because Johnny doesn't understand what he's writing you know I just think that maybe we could have found out about one or maybe two of uh, Johnny's sexual encounters not like 10 you know maybe just bring it down to just a couple. Also, there's a question uh, around whether or not Johnny Truant is actually having these experiences, or is he just like a unreliable narrator? I I is he like uh, Jay from In Between Us? First rule of Caravan Club is that everyone gets some. Second rule of Caravan Club is don't tell anyone about the first rule because it's a massive lie. Here's a passage, right? And I, I, I made a note of this, and this is one of the points where I started to roll my eyes and just be like, all right, Johnny. He says, I'm thinking, has another missing year resolved in song? Don't let me not get too far away from myself. They were only cats after all, only cats quadrupled mice devouring more, chasing shades, feeless catus. I know it's explained in the book, for those that have read it, it's explained in the book why he writes in this way. But I have to admit that there were parts um, of Johnny Truant's sections that I was skim reading. And I know that there's going to be fans of the book who are really dedicated to finding the hidden messages that are contained within the text and the subtext. And you're going to be going, well, what's the point of you even reading a book like this if you're not going to read every single line? Look, it's my bloody book, all right? I'll do what I want with it. I mean, I've kind of bashed on Johnny Truant a little bit there, but I will admit that one of my favourite sections of the book happened in the indices, which uh, involves a letter from uh, one of Johnny Truant's family members. That was definitely one of the scariest uh, sections of the book, and so I'm really glad that I took the time to read that. Um, yeah, I, I found that part to be very haunting, and so that's what I'm saying, you know, you, I, I disagree that you can skip these parts with Johnny Truant because they just add to the atmosphere. And if nothing else, this book relies on that atmosphere. So this is the part of the review where I would usually uh, give ratings of the book and I give a rating to like the plot, the characters, the setting, that kind of thing. Because this book is so different to anything else I've ever read, I don't feel as though I can do that. It wouldn't it would actually be a disservice to the book if I was to say, oh, this is the characters rank, ranked out of five. This is the, it, it, it's, it's just not that kind of book. You just have to take my word for it if you haven't read it. And if you have read it, then I think you'll probably agree with me. The only thing I can really say is, you know, would I recommend this book? And the answer is, <laughs> it depends. If you read a book to just kind of uh, enjoy the characters, enjoy the plot, and that's the main reason that you read books, then no, I, d I don't think that this book really would be for you. Don't get me wrong, I love, as you know, if you ever watch this channel, characters is the main thing for me. But yeah, this I went into with my expectations kind of set. The, that's not what this book's about. This is about a unique experience that you're going to have. If you read a book for, uh, you know, if it's important to you that there is a clear resolution and a linear narrative, definitely this book is not going to be for you. But if you read for like I mentioned, the kind of atmosphere, uh, that kind of atmospheric writing or escapism, maybe give this book a shot, I think. Um, also, if you're open to many interpretations being possible uh, and you like to engage in a discussion after you've read a book, this would be fantastic for a book club, for example, um, and you like the themes and uncovering hidden meanings and solving the puzzle, then I think you're probably going to like this book quite a lot. I don't think that the characters 
chapters were particularly interesting in any way, but there were sections of this book where I was literally checking over my shoulder. Very rarely do that. And the best thing I can say about this book is that whilst I didn't enjoy it for the same reasons that I usually enjoy books, it's an experience like no other that I, I've ever had in my reading journey. And so what I'm basically saying is read this book if you're a weirdo, because a weirdo like you would probably like it. Anyway, I suppose the question of this video is, what did you think of this book if you've already read it? Uh, what is your interpretation of some of the characters, the themes and the major events? Please make sure to maybe put a little spoiler warning, you know, so just in case anyone that hasn't read it goes into the comment section. Anyway, this was book number one of my 10 challenging book series uh, that I'm going to be reading. The next book, by the way, j just to let you know, I'm not going to be reading and reviewing these books one after the other. There's going to be like some kind of light sci-fi and horror and fantasy, just like regular. But this, these are books that I'm going to be reading throughout the course of the next year or two. Uh, the next challenging book that I plan on reading and reviewing is Herman Melville's Moby Dick. And I'm going to be doing a deep dive. <laughs> uh, uh, subscribe for more banter like that. If you'd like to see that video and that review, then you can click up here. Thanks so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it and happy reading.